good evening. Good evening. Welcome to Lighthouse Baptist Church. I think, uh, actually, they're all coming in right now in the back door, but I feel like maybe a number of uh, our, our, our usual crews probably still under Baptist nap getting ready for uh, tonight, staying up till midnight. How many, they actually do try to do that every year, stay up till midnight, watch the ball or whatever you like to watch until New Year's happens? Anybody? All right, there's a few. How many try and are very rarely successful? That would be me more often than not. So but anyway, happy New Year's to everyone that's here this evening. Uh, just a couple announcements. We won't go through all the ones that uh, I mentioned this morning. If you do want to know what is coming up, we have our bulletin as well as the screens, usually before and after the services that show what's coming up, especially in the next couple of weeks for Lighthouse. The only thing I'm going to highlight in particularly is next Sunday during the Sunday school hour, we will begin for the next eight weeks our Discovering Lighthouse Sunday school class. That'll be led by Pastor Kern. That's great for any new members, any prospective members, anyone that's interested in learning a little bit more about what we believe here at Lighthouse Baptist Church and just wants to get to know a little bit more about that and even ask Pastor Kern some questions in regards to that as well. That will be starting next Sunday, January 7th, in the church library right down the hall. Any other announcements and so forth, like I said, you can look at the church bulletin, look at the screens, or you can ask my wife, and she knows everything that's going on there. <laughs> and she'll ask me. Uh, other than that, I do want to emphasize again the reading through the Bible in a year reading plans we have. Uh, Pastor Kern did hit it a little bit during his message. We have one that is just straight up beginning Genesis all the way to Revelations, reading the Bible in a year. The one that's a little more unique, and you may look at it and be like, what is going on with this one? It is uh, more by sections. You have a, a two readings, one you can split up in the morning and the evening, and it also leaves extra days in the month. It excludes if you want to say excludes weekends, and that's not saying you don't have to read your Bible on weekends or anything like that. That's more to say you are human, and like many of us who probably will start this challenge, uh, you will have times when you forget, or you sleep in too long, or you just mess up, and those extra days are to, hey, that's where you can catch up and finish that amount of reading during that month. So that right now, these are located on the table in front of the library, but soon to be also located in the next week on the main table in the foyer there underneath the TV screen. So if you want to grab one of those, we do encourage, uh, if you are going to get one, just so we have enough copies that you choose just one of the plans to go with, if that's a, your liking. Or if you, if you can't choose, you can grab both, but they'll be out there uh, for you, you to grab after the service. Other than that, let's get started with a word of prayer. All right, it's good to be in God's house tonight. Let's go ahead and open things up with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you so much. And God, we thank you for every opportunity that we have to come and to be in your house and to be with your people. And Lord, we pray that you would anoint this time together with you, Lord, that we'd be able to, to lift the name of Christ in all that we do. And Lord, in my own heart, in my own life, Lord, as I come before you now, I pray that you'd help me, Lord, to be surrendered to you, to hear from you, to know your will and your way. And Lord, I pray that you would bless each and every person that is here today. Father, help us all to be open to you to, uh, tonight. Lord, use this service for your honor and for your glory to affect change and, and encouragement in our life. Lord, we all need a little bit of encouragement. And Lord, you've told us to rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice and to be a rejoiceful people, Lord. We need to, we need to be recharged from time to time. So, Lord, I pray that you'd help us to find that joy tonight, to be encouraged, Father, by our presence with you. Just, just be with us tonight, Lord, as only you can. Help us to sense your presence, Lord, and to look to you for guidance, direction, and encouragement in the days ahead. And, Father, we'll be careful to give you all the praise, all of the glory, and every bit of the honor. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. All right, let's stand. Let's get singing this evening. We're going to sing a couple songs at the beginning here about the blood of Christ. If you open up your hymnals to 262, we'll sing, There is Power in the Blood. 262, we'll sing all four verses. <laughs>
I just look over here and just see. I, I know the pastor's son's not speaking in tongues over there, so I'm assuming he's trying to say power as many times as he can in the chorus. Anyway, if you could turn over another great hymn about the blood, t- hymn number 258, There is a Fountain Filled with Blood. Hymn number 258, we'll sing all four verses of this great hymn. And if you want, you can turn your hymns open to hymn number 448. Our next two hymns we're going to sing this evening greatly illustrate our need for God. And in each and every day, we need to lean upon his grace. And if you got to hymn number 448, that is day by day. And I'm going to read a brief hymn history about the lady that wrote this hymn for us this evening. And then we'll sing that great hymn. <laughs> The waves of revival that swept the Scandinavian countries during the latter half of the 19th century were greatly influenced by the wealth of fine hymns which flowed from the pen of Lena Sandell. Being a young, a frail youngster, she usually preferred to spend her time in her father's study rather than to join her comrades in play. When she was 26 years of age, she accompanied her father on a journey to Gothenburg, but tragedy, but tragedy occurred before the destination was reached. The ship gave a sudden lurch, and Lena's father fell overboard and drowned before the eyes of his devoted daughter. Although she had written hymns prior to this tragic experience, more songs began to flow out of her broken heart, which reflect a simple, childlike trust in God. 
Christ and a deep sense of his abiding presence in her life. The remarkable popularity attained by her hymns has been due to a large extent to the simple but melodious music written for them by such musicians as Oscar and Felt. Not only did he possess the gift of writing pleasing melodies that caught the fancy of the Swedish people, but he also traveled from place to place throughout the Scandinavian countries singing these folk-like songs to the accompaniment of his homemade ten-string guitar. Miss Sandell once said that Anfeld has sung my songs into the hearts of the people. Not only Anfeld, but also Jenny Lind, affectionately known as the Swedish Nightingale, used her sweet voice in the singing of these heartwarming hymns. Though she was internationally known for her formal concerts, concerting, it is said that she would sit with the common worker as their crude benches and sing these simple hymns about the Savior she loved and served. In the name of Andrew Del Skog, the translator of this hymn, Day by Day, was well known to the immigrant Swedish community in Midwestern America in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. He was born in Sweden and moved to St. Paul, Minnesota at the age of 12. He had only a sixth grade education, yet he edited seven hymnals, numerous works of the masters, and wrote a textbook on theory. For the last 50 years of his life, he was active in the religious life of the Minneapolis-St. Paul area, where he was associated with the illustrious Pastor E. August Skogsberg. The two men were frequently described as the Swedish counterpart of the Moody and Sankey team. Linda Sandell was married to a Stockholm merchant, C.O. Berg. 1876, when she continued to sing her, sign her hymns with the initials L.S., by which she was affectionately known throughout Sweden. She has often been called the Fanny Crosby of Sweden for her many fine contributions to gospel hymnody. Let us stand as we sing one of those hymns. 448, day by day, we'll sing all three. song. Turn over to 435. 435. Brother Jones, I just want to say thank you for holding down the orchestra this evening. So, 
All right, someone's got to toot his horn. Yes, hymn number 434, 435. I need thee every hour to sing all four verses of this. Please remain standing for scripture reading. All right. Our memory verse, Matthew chapter 1, verse 23. Jethro said he has this down pat. Matthew. So we'll have Jethro recite it, and if he does good, we'll just say it's good, right? <laughs> Are you ready, Jethro? He's like, yeah, I got this, no problem. All right, everybody there? I'm going to read because when you're up here, you mess it up easy. Ready? Begin. Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Matthew 1, 23. Good job. Everybody ready to do by memory? All right, ready? Begin. Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Matthew 1, 23. All right, good job. We have a new one coming up next time. Turn over to Matthew chapter 22 as we continue our study in Matthew. And I'll be reading uh, verses 11 through 14 if you want to follow along. Matthew 22, verse 11. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he saith unto him, Friend, how comest thou in hither, not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Let us pray. Lord, thank you, Lord, for another year, Lord, 2023, Lord. I pray, Lord, as we go into this new year in the next few hours, Lord, that we would make it our 
desire of our heart and our goal to do the best we can to spread the gospel to those people that we have contact with, Lord. As we were singing that song, I need thee every hour, Lord, help that, Lord, to be a, a prayer and a mantra for us as we go into the next year to always remember that we do need you, Lord. Without you, we can do nothing. And Lord, I thank you for the blessings that we've had. I thank you for the trials, the tribulations, all things that you've gotten us to go through, Lord, with your help and your help in our life is always need it, Lord, no matter if it's a good time or a bad time. I pray now you just be with Pastor. Give him the words, Lord, that we need to hear, Lord. I pray you block out the distractions in our minds. Help us to focus on the truth that you want us to hear from your word tonight. We ask it in your name, Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much, and you may be seated. I am grateful that you are here tonight in the Lord's house. No better place to be. I know that you're excited and ready to be here because you got your Baptist nap. And... So <laughs> I don't believe them. I think that's too much energy not to have gotten their nap, so uh, praise the Lord. But it is good to be with you in the Lord's house. If you're happy to be here, say amen. amen. Looking forward to a new year, so let me go ahead and say real quickly before we get into the message tonight, happy new year. Pray that uh, whatever it is you have planned, you have a great time coming into the new year. My son is actually flying in tonight from Colorado, so we're looking forward to seeing him even after the service tonight. So we have that planned and looking forward to spending time with family and uh, whatever you have planned just enjoy it have a great time and lift the name of Christ in all that you do let's go ahead and get into our time together in around the word of God tonight it's been a few weeks however since uh, we've been in our study so let's take just a, a few minutes on the front end here and do a little bit of review Jesus came into Jerusalem for the last time in chapter 21 his entry uh, into the city on a donkey marks the beginning of the final week of our Lord's uh, uh, time here before his crucifixion. Now, most recently, he had been addressing the leaders of the Jewish people, the chief priests and the elders, as the Bible says. They had come to him to ask him where it was that he believed he got this authority for, to, to do the things that he was doing and, and act the way that he was acting among the people. And Jesus turned the question back on them by asking them where John Baptist got his authority from. And they were unwilling to answer him. And Jesus then challenged them to think about their spiritual condition by asking them about two kinds of sons. And one of the two sons is the kind of, of, of son who will say all the right things, but really has no desire or intention of doing the right thing, though he says all the right things. Clearly, Jesus is talking about these Jewish leaders that are standing right there in front of him. He's, he's referring to them. Then he transitions right into a parable about a householder and his vineyard. In this parable, Jesus explains the wickedness of those that the householder, or in this case God, had left in charge of the vineyard, or again in this case Israel. And once again, Jesus is speaking about the chief priests and elders. Look back real quickly at chapter 21 uh, and look at verse number 45. And when the chief priests and Pharisees heard his parable, they perceived that he spake of them, and they perceived correctly. Jesus was indeed addressing them. Then coming into chapter 22, Jesus delivers yet another parable to the people, to the leaders. However, in this new parable, he is not speaking about the leaders per se. This time he is speaking about the common people of Israel rather than their leaders. He calls them, the common people, uh, those that are bidden or the, them that had been bidden to the to the wedding feast. Look again at verse number three. Well, let's start in verse number two. The kingdom of heaven is likened to a certain king which made a marriage for his son and sent forth his servants. So the king sends out his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding and they would not come. And so them that are bidden are the, the nation of Israel. That's who he is speaking about. All of the people, not just the leaders in this case, but the people of Israel. And we find in this parable at least we found in our last study that the people themselves were either indifferent to the things of God, not really willing to, to hear and to respond to the call of God, or they were just as hostile to the servants of God as the leaders were in the last parable that we had seen. And so look with me again at verse number five about the, the, the two attitudes here. There's indifference and there's hostility. In verse five it says, 
Uh, but they made light of it, of the call upon them to come to the wedding feast and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And so they are indifferent to the call of God. And the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. So there's that hostility. Consequently, with this parable, Jesus tells about a shift in God's relationship to mankind. Jesus alluded to, to this shift when he was commenting on his last parable in chapter 21. Look again there at verse number 43, chapter 21 and verse 43. The Bible says, therefore, I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you, from the, from the Israelites, and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. So there's this transition that Jesus is talking about, alluding to, and he, and he mentions it here in this parable as well, here in chapter number 22. God is going to take the kingdom and give it to a new nation now we learned, I hope you remember, in our study of that particular parable in chapter 21 uh, that, uh, that this new nation that God is going to give it to is the church which Jesus promised to build and it is defined as a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, the Bible says, a peculiar people. So with this parable, Jesus illustrates that this transition is taking place by stating that the king sends his servants into the highways to invite any and all to the wedding feast that he has prepared. In other words, the calling has transitioned from those that were bidden or the Jews, as we saw in verse number three, to really everyone, that everyone may come, both Jew and Gentile. So that is a quick review and brings us to our text tonight where Jesus moves beyond this transition from Jew to the church and the call just going to those that are Jews and going out to all, to the Jew and to the Gentile alike. And it brings us into or unto the wedding feast itself. Now at the feast, the king comes to greet his guests. And as he greets them, he comes across one who is not prepared. One who does not have on, the Bible says, the wedding garment. He's not wearing it. So look with me again at verse number 11. The Bible says, and when the king came in to see the guests, so he comes to, to see them, to greet them, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he said unto him, friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he, that man that did not have the garment, was speechless, the Bible says. And so he comes ac across this man, and when confronted, when, when the king confronts this out-of-place guest, asking him why he's there without the, the garment on, he's unable to give an answer. And therefore, he is sent away by the king. And so look again at verse number 12. The Bible says, And he said unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot and take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. There in that place shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then Jesus says, for many are called, but few are chosen. So there's this wedding feast that God has prepared. He calls those that are bidden. They're indifferent or hostile to it. And so the Lord says, let's transition. Let's send the call out to everyone, both Jew and Gentile, representing again the transition from the Jew to the church age, if you will. And so we see all of this happening. And then at the wedding feast, God comes across one, or the, the, the king in this case comes across one who doesn't have the garment on, and he confronts him, and the man is unable to answer. He's speechless, the Bible says, and so he's cast into outer darkness, and then Jesus asks this question, or, or, or makes this statement, for many are called, but few are chosen. Chosen. I mean, there is a word in God's word that has been used, abused, and confused over the years. So let's talk about it tonight. 
And we begin with, number one tonight, the chosen Jews. The chosen Jews. Now remember that Jesus refers to the Jews as the bidden at the beginning of this parable. Referring again to all of Israel. All of Israel are the bidden people because the whole nation is the chosen people of God. Turn with me to Deuteronomy. Don't lose your place here in Matthew. We're coming right back there. But I want you to see this again. We, see, we saw this earlier in our study. When, uh, last time we met when we were talking about the first part uh, of this parable. But let's look at it again in Deuteronomy chapter number 7 and verse number 6 once you get there. And again, once again, all of Israel are the bidden people because the whole nation itself is the chosen people of God. And the Bible clearly states this fact for us. And we find one of those places here in Deuteronomy chapter number 7. And look at at verse number 6. For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath, what's the next word, church? The Lord thy God hath chosen thee, this holy people. He hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you. So there it is again, the idea of being chosen. Choose you because you were more in number than any people, for ye were the fewest of all people. And so the idea that Israel itself is the chosen people of God. And as we learned in our study of the transition from Israel to the church, the fact of Israel's chosenness never meant that the Gentiles were excluded even in the Old Testament period. They were never meant to be excluded from the blessings of God. God chose Israel not for them to be insular and keep that blessing to themselves, but for them to be mission-minded and to take that, that, that chosenness unto the nations that they too could become Jews as well. So according to God's word, anyone who was not born a Jew, could become a Jew. And the Jewish people, once again, were expected to be a mission-minded people. Now, we don't have time to go over all of that that we've learned already about that. But you can go back and listen if you'd like. But read the Word of God and you'll find that they were required to be a mission-minded people. So anyone who thus becomes a Jew, a Gentile that became a Jew in the Old Testament period, would become a a part of God's chosen nation, the Jews. And thus, by becoming part of the Jews, they too would be among them that are bidden to the marriage. However, Jesus declares in his parable that many of these same chosen people do not come to the king's feast, right? So here's the chosen nation. They are all chosen. Again, in verse number three, it says that they are the bidden ones. They're, they're the ones that have been bidden to come, if you will. And then when the, fa- uh, the call finally comes for them to actually come, there are many that refuse to call, though they have been the bidden ones all along. They have been the chosen ones all along, and yet they do not come. Look again, if you would, please, at verse number three. Oops, we need to turn back. I said that we would, didn't I? Let's go back to Matthew chapter number 12. Or, I'm sorry, 22. And look at me once again, if you would, please, at verse number three. The Bible says that the king sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the, to the wedding, and they would not come. Many of them refused to come. They were indifferent to the call. Look again at verse number five. But they made light of it. They didn't think it a weighty thing, a thing to be, to be concerned about. And rather than coming, they went the other way. They went to their own way, one to his farm and another to his merchandise, the Bible says. And so once again, Jesus is declaring here that the same chosen people do not come to the king's feast. Why, if they are the chosen people of God, do they not come when the Lord calls? And the reason is, that a living relationship with God Almighty God cannot be had by being in, born into any family. Amen? If you have children, your children are not Christian because they are born into your family. You don't have Christian blood that they inherit. Amen? Amen? They may come to a Baptist church and be in a Baptist church all their lives. They may grow up calling themselves Baptists, but that don't make them Baptists. That's pretty good English, right? 
That doesn't make them the thing. No one comes into the family of God because of the family that they are born into. They are two separate things. And it's the same thing with the Jews. Turn with me, if you would, please, to Romans chapter number 9. Again, a living relationship with God cannot be had by being born into any family. That has always been true. As true for us today as it was for the Jews back then. Not everyone who was a part of the chosen nation, therefore, of God, was also a child of God. Do you see the difference? They could be part of the chosen nation because God chose this nation, but that doesn't mean that everyone in that nation is an actual child of God, having come into the family of God, coming into that living relationship with the Lord. And so here in Romans chapter number 9, we see this. The Bible says, look with me if you would please at verse number 6. Not as though the word of God had taken none effect, for they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. And so in this verse, there are two kinds of Israel. Let's call the two kinds of Israel national Israel and the Israel of God. You with me? Those that are in the family of God. And so you can be in Israel, you can be of Israel, you can be born an Israelite and yet not be the Israel of God. You, you can be a national, nationally speaking, an Israelite and yet not be a child of God. Now this is interesting because the Calvinistic understanding of the chosen of God or the elect as they like to call them is that if you are elect, then you have been chosen from the foundation of the earth to be a child of God. The non-elect are not chosen to be a part of the family of God. The Bible, on the other hand, indicates that in the case of Israel, there are two kinds of chosenness. Do you see that? There are those that are chosen because they are part of that chosen family of God, or that chosen nation of God. And then there are those that are chosen within the nation itself to be the sons of God. So you can be part of the national Israel and yet not be a part of the Israel of God. So why would God choose some of Israel and not all of Israel to be his sons, to be the real true Israel of God? Before we answer that question, I want you to remember that Jesus has told us about a transition that is occurring from the Jew to the church age, if you will. God is transitioning from Israel to the institution, if you will, of the church. So let's talk about, secondly tonight, as we get a little bit deeper, deeper into this idea of the chosen, let's talk about the chosen church. We see a, a little bit here about the chosenness of the Israelites, of the Jews. Now let's talk about the church itself, the chosen church. Now the first truth that we note is that the call in the transition, the call to, to come to the feast, goes out now to everyone. It went originally to those that were bidden, but now it goes to everyone. And therefore, anyone who is willing is invited to come. So let's go back now. I believe I took you over to Romans 9. Go back to Matthew 22 real quickly. And look with me at verse number 9. And so the call is given by the king. Let's, let's just back up to verse number 8. Then saith he to his servants. So the king says to his servants, the wedding is ready. But they which are bidden are not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage. Invite everyone to come. And so that's what we find Jesus, as Jesus explains this transition from the Jew to the church age, to the institution of the church and the time that we live in today. And we find both uh, these aspects that, uh, that, that Jesus mentions here taught in the ch to church age saints in the word of God. For instance, the word of God is very clear that the call goes to everyone. All God's people said, the Bible says in Mark 16, 15, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Go out into the highways and everyone you find to preach the gospel to them. And so the call goes indiscriminately to everyone. And then secondly, Anyone who is willing may be saved. So those that, that, that hear the message, that are willing to receive the message, may be saved. For whosoever, the Bible says, shall call upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved. Not maybe, not might be, not I hope so, but a shall be saved kind of salvation. Amen? And that is to whosoever. A whosoever is a anyone soever. Amen? 
And so to all those that you preach the gospel to, everyone that you preach the gospel to is a whosoever. Any one of those people could be saved if they choose, if they so choose. And so that's the idea that we find in the parable that Jesus gives. And it is the, the truth that is taught during the church age in other, in other places in the New Testament. However, there is a condition. In order to come to the feast, you must be wearing the wedding garment. So look again here in chapter 22 at verse number 11. And when the king came to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he said unto him, Friend, thou camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? He was speechless. So the condition is, is that if you're going to come and be in the family of God, you've got to have this garment. Now turn with me to Isaiah real quickly. Isaiah 61. And here in Isaiah, this wedding garment is called a robe. Isaiah 61. And look at verse number 10 once you get there. Isaiah 61, 10. The Bible says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. I still hear some pages turning, so let me start over again. Verse number 10. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of, what's the next word, church? He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with her, with her jewels. The idea, again, of a, of a wedding, so to speak, a feast. And you have to come to that feast robed in a robe of righteousness, the Bible says. Now, to, uh, don't, stay here for just a minute. Back in Matthew 22... The first part of the parable, the part that we've already studied and we've already looked at, in that first part of the parable, there are those who do not come to the wedding feast because they're indifferent to it. Remember, they went back to their farm, they went back to their merchandise, they treated it lightly, the Bible says, and so they didn't didn't put any weight into the call itself, and so they're indifferent to it. They do not want to come. But then there are also those that are hostile to the message. They are hostile to the things of God, and they are hostile to the servants of God, taking them and slaying them, as the Bible says. But in this next part of the parable that we are looking at tonight, we find that there's another kind of person. There's the kind of person who's indifferent, hostile, not interested in coming, not interested in the feast itself. But there's another kind of person that we find here that does want to come. And so he does come to the feast. But he is not robed in the wedding garment. So he's not like the one that goes back to his merchandise. He's not like the one that goes back to his farm. Here is one that comes to the wedding, but he's not robed in the wedding garment. And so this represents the fact that there are many, even today, who want to be a child of God and believe indeed that they are a child of God, but they are not. Because they are not robed in the wedding garment. They're not robed because they are trying to come to God in their own way. They are trying to robe themselves, and it doesn't work. You cannot robe yourself. Look again at Isaiah 61. That's why I wanted you to stay here for just a moment longer. Look at it again. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for... I have clothed myself with the garments of salvation. Is that what it says? No, it says that God hath clothed me. God does the clothing. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. The robe of righteousness has got to come from God, not from ourselves. It is God that must cover us. It is God that must robe us. No matter how much we may desire to come... It is ineffective if God does not robe us. You with me? In in other words, it's not in our will, so to speak, to come. If God is not willing, so to speak, then we can't come. God must give us this robe of righteousness. And so this brings us to the issue once again of the chosen. Those God chooses 
to receive to be his children. And so the million dollar question, the one that everyone wants to know the answer to is simply this. Who has God chosen? Who are the elect? Now to begin with, the only way to get into his family is to come God's way, right? The only way to get into God's family is to come God's way. Jesus told, told us what that way is. When he saith, when Jesus saith, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. So there's no way to come into the family of God but by the Lord Jesus Christ. So Jesus is God's ordained way, if you will, to come into the family of God. We've also seen that to come to the wedding feast, you have to be wearing the wedding garment. You have to have that robe of righteousness, as it is called here in Isaiah. By the way, go ahead and turn with me now back to Matthew, if you would please, Matthew 22. So Jesus is God's ordained way for us to come into the family of God. But again, as we have seen, we must be robed about with that robe of righteousness. Therefore, if Jesus is the only way to come into the family of God, then we must get the robe of righteousness from him. Does that make sense? It can't be from us. As we've already alluded to in Isaiah, we don't robe ourselves. We must be robed upon. The robe must be gifted to us, given to us. If Jesus is the only way, then that means that the ones that God chooses are those that his son has robed with righteousness. But then we must ask, who does he robe? Who gets the robe? Does God choose who will be robed? Now the Calvinists believe that God chooses who will be robed. They are called the elect or the chosen, if you will. But if God's choice was the only choice that factored into the equation then everyone would be saved. Everyone would be robed with righteousness. The Bible says the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, and not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So clearly stated in the word of God, it is not God's will that any should perish. Therefore, if his will was all that is involved, then all would be saved because he is not willing that any should perish. And so if it, if, if it is not God's will that any should perish, and yet many do perish, then another will must be at play. Do you agree? Does that make sense? And so the Bible says in Revelation 22, the spirit and the bride say, come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. If you don't will it, you won't take it, but if you will, then you will take it. In other words, the water of life is supplied by God, and God wants everyone to have that water of life. That is his will. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should drink of the fountain of the water of life. But then he says, whosoever will come and drink of it. So there are two wills involved here. There's the will of the Father that is not willing that any should perish. And then he says, look, it's available to any. Any may come, whosoever will. Amen? And so there's this second will involved. The Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever. In John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. Anyone can believe in him. Whosoever is willing to come to that water of life and take a drink because he's thirsty, God says will receive that life. But you've got to be willing. I am willing, God says, are you. It is my will that you should drink of the water of life. Are you willing to drink? 
And so it is God's desire that all should be saved, but he will not force anyone to be saved. Therefore, God chooses those who choose him. The Bible says he came unto his own and his own received him not. They did not choose him. Remember, they went off to their farm. They went off to their merchandise. They considered it a light thing. And and so his own received him not. Those that were bidden did not receive the bridegroom. They would not come unto him, Jesus would say later. And so they would not choose the Lord. They received him not. And then in the next verse, the Bible says, but as many as received him, as many of those that chose to receive the Lord, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. As many as believe, as many as receive, as many as choose to drink of the water of life freely. Whosoever. So the only way to choose God, however, is by faith. Turn me to Romans 3, if you would, please, real quickly. Romans chapter number 3. Romans chapter number 3. In verse number 22. Oh, I did say Romans, didn't I? I turned all the way over to John. All right, Romans 3 and verse number 22. The Bible says, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith. So there's this righteous robe, if you will, and the righteousness is of God. It's not of man. It doesn't come from us. It comes from outside of us. The righteousness of God, which is by faith of of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all. And so this robe can come upon all, come unto all and upon all that believe. So anyone can receive it because it comes to all, but it only comes upon those that believe. Do you see that? So the robe of righteousness, if you will, that is God's righteousness that we must be robed in, not our own, not of our own working, of our own making, but the righteousness that is of God comes to us by faith. It comes unto all, but upon all them that believe. For there is no difference for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And so freely we can receive this gift of righteousness, this robe of righteousness. And so we have found the answer to the million dollar question. Who does God choose? Who are the chosen Who are the elect? God chooses all those who choose him by faith. Receiving the robe of righteousness that was won for them and given to them by his son. Is that clear? He chooses those who choose him. For many, however, this message is just too good to be true. There must be something more to it. Something more that we have to do in order to add to our salvation. It can't be as easy as just God giving us a robe of righteousness. Look, it is important to understand this distinction. The Bible tells us very clearly that you're either in Christ or you're not. And in Christ, consider Christ to be that robe. When God sees you, he sees the robe, he sees Christ. You are either in Christ or you're not in Christ. Christ is the uh, the true chosen one. You become chosen because you are in him. You're not chosen outside of Christ. You're not chosen for election. You're not chosen for non-election. You're just outside of Christ. Christ was chosen. Go back to Isaiah 42 and you can, you can find it there. That he was the chosen one. That is a messianic portion of scripture. And we know that because it's repeated again about Jesus in Matthew chapter number 12. But the fact of the matter is Jesus is the chosen one. He is the elect one. And you become elect when you are in him. But you can only get in him by choosing to be in him. He doesn't force you to put on the robe. 
but you can't create the robe. It is God's. You must be robed with it. To be in Christ, to have that robe of righteousness, but for some, this is just too good to be true. Something, there must be something that I have to do to add to my salvation, to make my, my, my salvation real. And so they try to come their own way. But Jesus says that they are refused, as we find in the parable here in Matthew 22, that they are cast out because they do not have the garment on. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door of the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber, and a thief and a robber is rejected. Now get this, please understand this. It's not as though they view themselves as a thief or a robber. They're not indifferent like those that went back to their farm and back to their merchandise and considered the call of God a a light thing. They're not like those. So they're not indifferent. They want to come. But they refuse to come through Jesus Christ. Jesus never gave them the garment of righteousness. They're trying to construct their own. And so many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils. And in thy name have done many wonderful works. Again, they are not indifferent to the things of God. They are trying to come. They are doing what they know or what they believe needs to be done for God Almighty God. Prophesying, casting out devils, and doing many wonderful works. And there's nothing wrong with any of those things, but they can't save you. You cannot make yourself righteous. Now listen, a child of God ought to be doing those things. But you don't do those things to be saved. You don't do those things to be closer to God. You with me? You cannot be saved by doing those things. And so they're not indifferent. They are trying to do the things that they believe need to be done that God would approve of. And then will I profess unto them, Jesus said, I never knew you. I never gave you a robe. You were never in my family. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. You see, all of their good works are stained. And that is the problem. As Isaiah himself said, All of our righteousnesses, all of our very best things, in this passage, it's the prophesying, it's the casting out of devils, all the good things, the many wonderful works, all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. They are stained with the fact that we have sinned against God. And I I don't know how any other way to state this more clearly. It's, you, you have never been in trouble with God. You will never be in trouble with God for doing the right thing. A sinner has never been in trouble for, with God for doing the right thing. It's the fact that they did wrong, the, the, the wrong thing. Adam and Eve were not kicked out of the garden for doing the right thing. They did one wrong thing. One wrong thing. How many of you have only done one wrong thing? No, come on. Yeah. Yeah, right. Parents? teaching moment amen and that's the issue is the sin in our life and that sin is what stains even the righteous things that we do you can't righteousness your way out of the uh, of the things you did wrong God didn't say, well, you know, Adam and Eve, it was just this one sin. I'm going, to take, I'm going to take your whole history of all the good things that you did while you were in the garden, and I'm just going to kind of wipe that. It doesn't work that way. You understand? Sin is the problem. It must be dealt with. And the only way to deal with it is not by your robe of righteousness. It is by the spotless righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is a gift that you must receive. To as many as received him, to as many as received that robe of righteousness, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. In other words, you are not until he gives you the power to become. You with me? Oh, there's so much that could, could be said about all of this. But again, our good works are stained with iniquity. We must receive that robe of righteousness. 
But there are those that never receive it, though they are trying to get into the very throne of God. They're trying to get into the wedding feast, but they never knew Jesus. They proclaimed him. They prophesied about him. They cast out devils in his name, but they never knew him. And so we've seen tonight that Jesus said, for many are called, but few are chosen. That word chosen, as we said earlier, has been used, abused, and confused over the years. But it really is not that difficult. Many are called because the call goes to everyone. Many are called because the call goes to everyone. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. God is not willing that any should perish, and so the call goes to everyone. But only few are chosen. Those who are chosen are those who choose God. The few that are chosen are chosen because they met God's requirement. They chose the Lord by faith. God chooses them who choose him. And again, I don't know any other way to state it more simply. Jesus is the chosen one. If you say yes to him, if you choose him, then he covers you. Amen? God chooses the elect are those that are in the elect one. The chosen are the ones that are in the chosen one. It really is as simple as that. Many are called, the call goes to everyone, but few are chosen. Only those that have chosen to be in Christ, to meet God's condition. So if you have chosen him, then you have been chosen by God. Therefore, if you've been chosen by God, you are his servant. And as his servant, he has sent you into the highway to call everyone to the feast that he has prepared. Turn one last time to Matthew 22 and we're done. Matthew 22. If you are chosen because you have chosen him, then you are the servant of God. And the servants of God, the Bible says, he has sent into the highways and the hedges, so to speak, to call everyone to the feast that he has prepared. So looking at one last time at Matthew 22 in verse number 8. The Bible says, Then said he to his servants, Then said God, if you will, to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which are bidden are not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid them to the marriage. Go out into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So these servants went out into the highways. The question is, are we going to go out into the highways? We are the sent ones. Will you go? In the new year, in 2024, will you take his message to the lost? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for your great goodness and kindness to us. Lord, I thank you, Father, for the robe that you have provided for us. That my Lord and my Savior lived the perfect life, the righteous life that I cannot live. And he offers that to me and to everyone that is here today. That gift of a righteous life. To exchange my broken and sin-filled life for his righteous life. What an exchange. What a glory to know that when God the Father sees me, he sees the righteousness of his Son. But Lord, the world needs that message. And so Lord, I pray that you would impress upon us as your chosen ones because we have chosen you, that you have now sent us to be your servants, to go out into the highways and tell others. Help us, Father, to renew our commitment to the gospel, to evangelization, to reaching the lost, to bringing them in. And Lord, we're careful to give you the praise and the glory and the honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with me this evening?